Hello, hi, Ty. What an absolute pleasure it is here to welcome you. We have a fabulous program planned. You are in for a real treat. My name is Heather Young. I am the very proud Vice President of Communications and Public Relations at OIST, the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. And I'm also your MC this afternoon at this public lecture by 2022 Nobel Prize winner and OIST adjunct professor Svante Pebo. So please, turn off your phones so that we may have your undivided attention for the next two hours. First, we will be privileged to hear from the governor of Okinawa, then the president of OIST, and as she will introduce Professor Pebo. And then we will hear from our guest of honor. After that, we will conclude with a question and answer period. And this is your chance to ask a Nobelist about what inspires him or where his research is heading from here. We have planned an afternoon of learning and illumination. But let's start off by expressing our appreciation. Thank you very much to our co-sponsors, the Okinawa Prefectural Government and the Council for the Promotion of OIST. And to our supporters, the Okinawa Prefectural Board of Education, Ona Village, and the Ona Board of Education. Thank you. We are very fortunate to have here with us Governor Den Denny Tamaki. Governor Tamaki has been representing the people of Okinawa in his current role since 2018. Prior to that, he was a member of the Okinawa City Council and he also represented Okinawa's third district in Japan's House of Representatives. Please welcome Governor Tameki. Hello, everyone. First of all, I would like to congratulate Dr. Tsubante Pebo for 2022 Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine. Please give him a big applause. Thank you. At this Nobel Prize season public lecture, we I'd like to say a few words. As you know, OIST was established with the purpose of sustainable promotion of Okinawa and the development of science and technology of the world. It's been 10 years, and with its international and interdisciplinary structure, it has done researches for about COVID or quantum technology, as well as genome reading of mozuku seaweed, which is the specialty of Okinawa. And uh, with OIST genome data, Dr. Pebo has been researching Neanderthals and Denisovans and compare them with the current human being. In Okinawa, Minatogawa man bones from Paleolithic age was found. And uh, I heard that genetic contribution of archaic people on the modern people affect the symptom of coronavirus. So I look forward to Dr. Pebo's research. Today we have many children from Okinawa, and uh, the first Nobel laureate from the research institution in Okinawa encourages children of Okinawa. And, uh, we are blessed to have the opportunity to hear directly from the research researchers. And uh, we would like to take advantage of this to encourage Okinawan children to be leaders in future. I am the chair of the Council for Promotion of OIST, and uh, the Council is committed to introduce OIST researches to the general public. I am looking forward to see more research results. And also, I am committed to support the 
research is at OIST. And、uh, I hope to see great research results. And I wish the best for the researchers at OIST as well as Dr. Peibo. Thank you very much, Governor of Okinawa, Deni Tamaki. Thank you, Governor Tamaki. Thank you and your colleagues for your ongoing support of OIST. I know that the governor has to make a quick exit、uh, to his next engagement. We're very grateful that he was joining us. Next, we will hear from Karen Markides, the president and CEO of OIST. Like Professor Pebo, President Markides hails from Sweden. An analytical chemist by training, she brings with her decades of experience in researching, educating, and leading at world class universities on three continents. Including time at Stanford, Brigham Young University, Chalmers University, Uppsala University, and the American University of Armenia. We are so pleased she joined OIST earlier this year to lead us into the future. Furthermore, we are delighted to have her here today to introduce our guest of honor. President Markides, welcome. First, I want to thank、uh, Governor Tamaki for coming here and show his interest for、uh, science. And、uh, now, also for you, ladies and gentlemen. What you will hear about here today is amazing. It's mind blowing, but it's still logic. Professor Svante Pebo, or Svante as we say in Sweden, Has opened a secret box for humankind to the understanding of our knowledge blo blocks and thereby explaining the main reason why we are reaching in different ways to, me to medicine and environment, while we humans are still so in similar in so many ways. In Japan and at OIST, we are so proud and、um, Enthusiastic that Svante decided to join OIST in May 2020 as an adjunct professor leading the Human Evolutionary Genomics Unit. Svante and his research unit fit s perfectly in the research culture that OIST stands for. The fact that Svante received his doctorate from Uppsala University, my home university, makes me also personally extra proud. This curiosity driven research culture that we have at OIST are becoming more and more important for the characteristics of universities in this century. Allow me to take this opportunity to express how grateful we are to the government of Japan and the Okinawa Prefecture government for their ongoing support of OIST, which e n a b l e us to fund. Curiosity driven research, where Svante is an excellent representative. We are at a crossroad where we can see that bold basic research plays an increasingly important role in society and is existential for the development of a sustainable future. Many of you know that Svante has developed techniques and approaches that allow DNA sequences from archaeological and paleontological remains to be determined. For this, he received numerous awards, including the 2020 Jap Japan Prize and the 2022 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. Over the course of his career, Svante has pioneered methods in extracting and sequencing DNA from ancient bones, resulting in several key discoveries that have rewritten what we know about human evolution and mobility patterns over the Earth's surface. His successful decoding of the Neanderthal. Uh, genome led to the finding that modern humans still contain traces of Neanderthal DNA. Unmistakable evidence that Homo sapiens and Neanderthals coexisted and interbred 
tens of thousands of years ago. He also identified an entirely new species of extinct humans, the Denisovans. Svante's curiosity had taken his re research even further. To identify variants of genes that are found only within modern humans, the research is aiming to see if these differences have resulted in functional changes, or in other words, how genetic variants that are unique to modern humans needs to be considered for our well-being and our health. For Svante, it all started at a very young age, when he became curious about Egypto Egyptology, and his interest was stayed with him through research uh, of the DNA of Egyptian mummies as a doctoral student, and later depending his knowledge of molecular biology methods. He focused on molecular genetics and managed to overcome numerous difficulties studying these ancient samples to unlock the secrets of genetic differences between Neanderthals and the Homo sapiens. We now know that 40,000 years after the last member of Neanderthal walked on the earth, their traces continue to live in our DNA, and Swante has given us a new scientific discipline, the discipline of paleogenomics. So, it is with great honor that I introduce our speaker, Professor Swante Pebo. Please join me to give him a very warm welcome. Well, uh, Governor Tamaki, President, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, what I then wanted to, want to do here is begin by just reminding you a little bit about things that I think most of you are well aware of, and that is that our genetic material, our DNA, is stored in every cell in our bodies on the chromosomes that we have inherited from our mothers and fathers. And it is stored there in the form of this famous double helical molecule, the DNA. And the information, the genetic information, is there twice, so to say. It's encoded in the sequence of these four letters or nucleotides, abbreviated A, T, C, and G. And it occurs on each of the two strands of the DNA. And that is important because when a cell will divide, those two strands are taken apart and new strands are synthesized with the old strands as templates. And this is of particular interest to us in our germline when the cells that will form a new individual are formed. And this process where the DNA molecule is duplicated is a very accurate one. But nothing is, of course, perfect in nature. So sometimes an error is made. The wrong letter is built in. And if that is not repaired before the DNA molecule replicates again, then that results in a mutation. And we can see the result of such mutations when we compare DNA sequences between individuals today. For example, between two individuals in this room. What you will then find is that approximately every thousand such letters differ between two individuals or between the two chromosomes that you inherited from your mother and from your father. And since these mutations then happen in every generation as a function of time, if you compare ourselves to a chimpanzee, for example, we will find more differences. On average, one every hundred letters, so about 10 times more. And we can then reconstruct the history of a piece of DNA or our whole genomes by using these mutations. And we gently depict that history in the form of these trees. And in this case, it's very simple, of course, the two DNA molecules into humans 
go back to a common ancestor here, and much further back, about 10 times further back, is there a common ancestor shared also with the chimpanzee. And as you will also know, our genome is rather big, over three billion such letters. So there is a lot of information there. That's it. Um, that is supposed to through and sort of the chromosomes, yes. About three billion such letters. So there is around three million differences between any two genomes that we can use to reconstruct our history. Our, and if you do that, if you start out just by looking at the genetic variation worldwide among humans, a surprising finding is that most of the variation exists in Africa. And the entire variation outside Africa, all over the world, outside Africa, is less than that. Although there are, of course, many fewer people living in Africa than outside Africa. And the reason for that is then that there is a component of the variation in Africa that doesn't exist outside. And the interpretation of that is that modern humans, the ancestors of everyone who arrived alive on the planet today, emerged in Africa, lived there and accumulated genetic variation there through these mutations, and part of that variation then went out of Africa and colonized the rest of the world. And with genetic tricks, we can also figure out when that emigration out of Africa happened, and it quite recently in evolutionary terms, less than 100,000 years ago or so. But an interesting thing then is that when modern humans left Africa, say between 50 and 100,000 years ago, they were not alone on the planet. There were other forms of humans around that already existed there. Most famously, in Western Eurasia, Neanderthals, and in Eastern Eurasia, in China, for example, other forms of humans that we know less about but begin to learn a little bit about now. So Neanderthals on the left here were these robust forms of humans that then emerged in Europe and Western Asia about 500, 600,000 years ago and lived there until modern humans to the right appear on the scene. Whoops, I should, um, let me see. Uh, until modern humans to the right there appear on the scene and the last Neanderthals died somewhere around 40,000 years ago. And our group is then, since 25 years or so, almost obsessed with Neanderthals to study them. And you may then ask why we should be interested in a form of humans that are not here anymore. And I think there are at least two reasons for that. One is that the Neanderthals are the closest relatives of present day people, no matter where we live on the planet. So if we want to define ourselves from a genetic or biological perspective as a group or as a species, if you like, it's the Neanderthals we should compare ourselves to and say, in what ways are we similar to them, in what ways are we different from them. Another interesting thing is, of course, that they were here rather recently, just 40,000 years ago, maybe 14, 1,500 generations ago. They were around, met our ancestors, and the question is, what happened then? How did one interact with each other? But if we now want to address this with genetic means, we need to retrieve then DNA from bones and skeletons that are at least 40,000 years old. And that work then goes back to the early 80s when we started looking at not Neanderthals, but ancient Egyptian mummies, which are two, three, or 4,000 years old. For example, this mummy here that's 2,300 years old, a mummy of a child from Egypt. If one looks in the uh, skin of this one in a mic microscope, you will see structures here that look like cell nuclei where the DNA would be preserved. 
And you can also, I should not touch that thing. <laughs> you can also stain uh, those cell nuclei with dyes that shows that DNA is there. So back at the time, I got very enthusiastic, extracted the DNA from these samples, replicated it in the bacteria, and showed that there were fragments of human DNA in there, and published that to great fanfare at the time. But what then happened over the next couple of years was that I came to realize that those DNA sequences were for sure not from the ancient mummy. They were probably from myself or from a museum curator or an archaeologist. Because what I had not realized was how sensitive all this was for contamination from tiny amounts of present-day DNA on dust particles, for example, in a room. So if we compare above here the DNA from a present-day person, from a blood sample, for example, to the DNA below, that you would extract from such an ancient mummy. There are a number of differences here you can note. One is, no, I will not touch that thing. Um, one is that there's a lot less DNA there, at least sort of in the order of uh, 100,000, a million fold less or so. The DNA is also degraded to a much smaller size, small little fragments that are chemically modified. And they're a, present in a large excess of DNA from microorganisms, from bacteria and fungi that have colonized the bones over tens of thousands of years. And that leads to a number of technical problems, but one is that even tiny amounts then of present-day DNA that may land in your experiments from a dust particle, for example, may totally overwhelm the results here and wouldn't even be noticed if you study present-day DNA. So over the years, we worked a lot on overcoming lots of these technical problems, working in clean room conditions, for example, to prevent contamination. We worked a lot of extinct animals because it's much easier to then recognize contamination from humans. So ground sloths in America, mammoths from Alaska or Siberia. But we were really interested in the Neanderthals. So in the early 90s, when the techniques had gotten better, we started coming back to the question about Neanderthals. And at the time, there were at least two ideas around how Neanderthals are related to present-day people. So one of them to the left here suggests that modern humans appear in Africa, come out of Africa to Europe and Asia, where Neanderthals and other forms live, and replace them with no mixture whatsoever. So that means that a person, say, living in Europe today would have no, no special relationship to Neanderthals at all. Another idea is that is now, uh, modern humans come, mix with Neanderthals here and with other groups in Asia. So a European person would be sort of slightly more related to Neanderthals than to people who live today in Africa, for example. And you could imagine all kinds of gradations between this, going from the left, no, uh, no contribution at all, to that Neanderthals are the direct ancestors of Europeans, which some people also thought. So we were very happy then in the early 90s when we got access to the first Neanderthal remains. And that's not any Neanderthal remains, it were the remains that gave their names to this group of humans that were found in 1856 in Neanderthal in Germany. So sampled from the upper arm here, and we focused on a part of the genome that was particularly easy to retrieve because it's present in many, many copies per cell, which is the mitochondrial genome that we inherit from our mothers and pass on to the next generations, always on the mother's side. So we focused on a particularly variable part of that part of the genome, cumbersomely studying short pieces, overlapping pieces, putting together a longer stretch of DNA. And we could then estimate how it is related to the mitochondrial genomes of present-day people and depicting that in such a tree. So 
So you will then find that the mitochondrial genomes of all people today, no matter where you are on the planet, have a common ancestor, something like 100,000, 150,000 years ago. And much further back is there a common ancestor shared also with the Neanderthals, about half a million years or a bit more ago. So this then showed that the Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA was very different from present people. So in this scheme of things, it was total replacement. There is no person today who walks around on this planet with a Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA. But it was also very clear that the mitochondrial genome is just a tiny part of our history, a tiny part of the genome, and reflects only the female side of history. The big picture contributed by both our mothers and fathers is in the nuclear genome. So the chance to address that came about 10 years later in the beginning of this millennium with new DNA sequencing techniques that allow you to sequence many, many pieces of DNA quite inexpensively and efficiently. We've worked on all steps in this process in how you extract such old DNA from the bones, how you modify it to a form that you can sequence and create a little database and then compare that with the human genome that became available. We also did a lot, looked at a lot of different archaeological sites to find the best preserved bones, focused on one site in southern Europe where we found, used three bones from Neanderthals that we extracted the DNA from and processed it, sequenced a lot of DNA fragments, and then mapped them to the human genome here, taking chemical modifications that present in them into account. So by 2010, then, we had a first overview of the Neanderthal genome, where we had seen a little over half of it at least once among our DNA fragments. So we could then begin to, to ask questions. And one question we were interested in was this question, what happened when modern humans met Neanderthals? And as we indicated, if one would have mixed, if modern humans would have mixed with Neanderthals in Europe, for example, then that would mean that Europeans today would share more genetic variants with Neanderthals than people today in Africa where there has never been any Neanderthals. So to address this, we put together a big consortium, actually, of um, uh, population geneticists that helped us analyze this, and we went out and sequenced five individuals from different parts of the world, one person from Europe, two from Africa, one from China, and one from Papua New Guinea, and did some very simple comparisons. So one comparison we did was simply to say, if we compare two individuals, and let's start with the two Africans first to illustrate this, we can compare these two genomes and find all the positions where they differ from each other. And then we take the Neanderthal genome and say, how often does the Neanderthal match the variant? This African or that African? And it should be 50-50, right? Because there's no reason to assume that Neanderthals contributed more DNA to one African than another African individual. And indeed, that's the case. Statistically speaking, there is no difference. But when we then did the same comparison between a French individual in Europe and an African individual, to my big surprise, we found more matching to the European individual, suggesting that there could have been a contribution there. More surprising even was that when we did this with a person from East Asia, from China, we again saw more matching, although Neanderthals are not believed to have been in China. Mm -hmm. um, and even more surprising than in Papua New Guinea, where there for sure has never been Af Neanderthals, it was the same situation. So the idea that came out of that was that when modern humans left Africa, they met Neanderthals probably for the first time in the Middle East, where we know there were Neanderthals. And if these, um, 
And if these early modern humans that then became the ancestors of the rest of the people outside Africa mixed with Neanderthals, they could sort of carry with them this Neanderthal contribution out to the rest of the world. And the result of that would be that people outside sub-Saharan Africa today have something like one or two percent of their DNA come from Neanderthals. What has since happened is that we have gotten much better Neanderthal genomes. We have particularly from a site in southern Siberia, at the Nisiva cave, for example, from this part of the sort of toe bone of a Neanderthal. Using new techniques we have developed, we have now gone from having this just a bit half of the Neanderthal genome to covering the entire Neanderthal genome, the entire part to which we can map these short things. So we've seen every position many, many times over and have a quality as high as from a genome from a present day person. And we have three such Neanderthal genomes of high quality and become can start comparing them to present day people, for example, looking on one chromosome here, one line is one present day person. Hmm. I don't know why this wants to disappear. Um, um, and in red, we have indicated segments of some tens of thousands of such genetic letters that are identical or almost identical to the Neanderthal genome. And you will see that different people here, different lines, carry different fragments of the Neanderthal genome. So you can then, and that adds up to something like one or two percent per individual. But what you can do is jump from person to person, for example, in this room, and see how much of the Neanderthal genome can I puzzle together in present day people. That's indicated in blue down there, and that ends up being something like 40 or 50 percent of the Neanderthal genome still exists in people alive today. So at that site in southern Siberia, the Nisiva cave, they discovered something that uh, was also extremely interesting, a tiny little bone that turned out to come from the tiny pinky of a child, from which we could also determine a good DNA sequence. And we were very surprised to find that that was not a Neanderthal, it was not a modern human, but something else here that went quite far back to a common ancestor 400,000 years ago or so, shared with the Neanderthals. These are distant relatives of Neanderthals that existed there in southern Siberia. We called them the Nisivans, and we could then ask, have they also contributed to present-day people? And indeed they have. We find no contribution in Europe, but wherever we look in Asia, we find a small but substantial contribution of 0.2, 0.3% of the DNA. And in Melanesia, in Papua New Guinea, for example, up to 5% of the genomes of people there come from these Denisovans. And not only that, you can look in more detail on this contribution of the Denisovans. This is a uh, in a study by a group at Princeton that have used our genomes and looked on in people in Papua New Guinea today, on this axis, what, how many fragments are there that are similar to the Neanderthal genome. Identity would be here, and you find these fragments there that come from Neanderthals. On the other axis, it's a Denisovan. And you find these fragments here that are quite distant, actually, more distant than the Neanderthal fragments from the Neanderthal genome uh, here. But if you then look, for example, in Japan, you find this contribution from Neanderthals. You find that the Nisivan contribution that's quite distant from our genome, but you find an additional contribution there that is very close to our genome. So this then suggests that at least two different, hey, hello, uh, two different Denisovan populations 
that were quite distinct from each other contributed to the people in East Asia, in China and in Japan. So if I should now summarize uh, for you what I, we think we know about the origin of modern humans of Neanderthals and Denisovans from studying genomes, Neanderthals and Denisovans have some common ancestor in Africa that leave Africa well over half a million years ago. They evolve in Western Eurasia to what we call Neanderthals, and in Eastern Eurasia then to what we call Denisovans. The border between these groups probably shifted over the millennia. We know that at some point at that Denisova cave, there were Neanderthals, at other point there were Denisovans there. And then modern humans appear in Africa two, three hundred thousand years ago, begin to leave Africa seriously after hundred thousand years ago, mix early on with Neanderthals, continue to spread and mix several times with Neanderthals. And in the East, they mix with Denisovans also several times. And they then continue to spread out to other parts of the world where no human forms had been before, to Australia, the Americas, and so on. And these earlier forms of humans disappear, but then live on a little bit in present-day people in these contributions. You may then ask if Africans are fundamentally different in not having a contribution from earlier forms of humans. I don't think so, but we are not ready to answer that conclusively because we have no genomes from other forms of humans in Africa yet. Modern humans obviously appeared somewhere in Africa, spread across the continent, and if one spread mixed with other forms outside Africa, one probably did it also inside Africa. So probably one will find that the same things have gone on in Africa. An interesting thing that's now going on is that we find very direct evidence of this mixture with Neanderthals. When we go back to very early modern humans, and so far this has only been done in Europe, for example, the first case was in Romania, where cavers in 2010 found a mandible that looked like a modern human mandible. It's dated to 40,000 years ago, so it's a very early modern human. And we were then very interested to look if this individual had mixed already, or its ancestors had mixed with Neanderthals. And on the chromosomes here, we marked in blue segments that are similar or identical to the Neanderthal genome. And you see there are huge, huge segments there, sometimes almost half of a chromosome. And such big segments, of course, indicate that in the family tree of this individual, there was a Neanderthal. And we can then show that six, five, or four generations ago, this individual had a Neanderthal in her family tree. And if we look in Bulgaria, a site that we recently studied, there one finds technology that's typical of these early modern humans. There, the earliest modern humans are 45,000 years ago, among the very earliest modern humans we have in Europe. 10,000 years later, there are other modern humans living at that site. And if you look at three individuals deep down there that are 45,000 years ago, all of them have Neanderthal relatives in their family tree. 10,000 years later, the people there look very much like people today. No close family relationship to Neanderthals. So the picture that is emerging is that when we begin to look at the very earliest modern humans that come out of Africa, almost all of them have close family ties to Neanderthals. So the picture that I think is emerging is that the very first modern humans mixed often with Neanderthals. And it may be that the story why Neanderthals and Denisovans disappear is not that one killed them all or so, but simply that they were absorbed into larger modern human populations that came. And there are some indications from archaeology that group size in modern humans were bigger than in Neanderthals and Denisovans. But what I then wanted to do before we end here 
is discuss with you what we can now do when we have genomes from our closest evolutionary relatives. We can compare that genomes to people today and to our closest living relatives, the apes. And when we find the genetic changes that we share, for example, with Neanderthals, but that's not there in the apes, these are then changes that happen on the common lineage to Neanderthals and present-day people. When we find something that's present only in the Neanderthals and where we look like the apes, these are changes that happen in the Neanderthal ancestors and spread to all of them. And when we find things that are unique to modern humans and not in the Neanderthals, that happen in our ancestors. So I will begin a bit with two examples of this Neanderthal variant there. And this is work that was done by Hugo Seberg, who is a postdoc in Stockholm and with us, and a guest scientist here at OIST. And he is particularly interested in ion channels, so proteins that sit in the cell membrane and let um, uh, ions go through the membrane when they are stimulated. And he noticed that this protein had three amino acid changes in it, in all Neanderthals we had sequenced, which is unusual. That is more than any other protein, actually, we have looked at. This is also a very interesting uh, protein, since it sits in the peripheral nerve endings and initiates a sense of pain when we hurt ourselves. So we expressed this protein uh, in Neanderthal form, modern human form, in human cells, and stimulated it. And you could then see that for a certain stimulation here, the red Neanderthal version let through more ions through the cell membrane as if it was more sensitive than the modern one. And we could show that that is not due to that it opens more rapidly, but that it remains open for a longer time before it's inactivated again after stimulation. We could also show that that effect is just due to two of these amino acid changes, and the third one seems to be irrelevant. And what we then did, which surprised us, was we thought this was specific to Neanderthals and was not present in present-day people. But when we looked in the UK Biobank, which is a big, big project in the United Kingdom, where they have more than 400,000 people that have answered questionnaires about their lives. You have the medical record and genetic information from everybody. So we can then look for these Neanderthal variants if they exist today in present-day people. And indeed, it turned out that some people in the UK, 0.4% of the population, so very few but some, did do carry this Neanderthal version. So, it has come over from Neanderthals when they met modern humans and exists in some people today. So we could then look in the questionnaires that these people had answered. And there were 19 questions there that had to do with pain, all kinds of pain, back pain, stomach ache, headaches, what have you, and see how often they report that they experience pain in their lives. First of all, for me, it was the first time I could play with such big population data. So big interest was just what does pain correlate with in our lives in general? And rather sadly, when you get older, the biggest correlation is with increasing age. The older you are, the more pain you have. And it's trivial. The older you are, the more medical issues you have. But more relevantly then, carriers of these Neanderthal variants here reported significantly more pain in their lives. And if we relate that to that age effect I mentioned, then it is as if you were, if you carry this Neanderthal version, it is as if you were eight or nine years older in terms of how much pain you report. So it seems indeed that carriers of this is more, are more sensitive to pain. Now, that doesn't mean that we can s conclude that the Neanderthals experienced more pain in our lives. Because as you all know, the pain sensation is very much modulated in spinal cord and particularly in the brain, depending on our mood and our attitudes, sort of our sense of pain is very different. 
However, um, it is interesting that people who today have one copy of this on one of our chromosomes do report more pain in their lives. This was present in all Neanderthals, so they had all inherited from their mothers and fathers and had it on both their chromosomes. So they had at least the ability to be more sensitive than people are today. So maybe we need to modify our view of Neanderthals as these insensitive, brutish individuals. Maybe they're actually almost too sensitive when modern humans appeared. Now, um, uh, the other example I want to mention concerns a hormone that many of you have heard about, I think, progesterone. It has many functions in the body, but is primarily produced by the ovary after ovulation and prepares the uterus for a possible pregnancy. And we are interested in the receptor there for the progesterone. And it was already known that it was a variant of this receptor that exists in the population. It has this distribution worldwide where it is absent in Africa and occur outside Africa at some frequencies. And variants that are like that turns out to almost always come from Neanderthals. So they're absent in Africa, present outside Africa. And this variant was known to be associated with preterm birth, so having premature babies which is, of course, a risk for the baby. So it seemed that this Neanderthal version of this variant would be a bad thing to carry because it would put the babies at risk. But something that one can now begin to do is to follow the frequency over time of such variant in the population. And we can do that because we begin to have thousands of modern human skeletons of different ages where we have genome information. Particularly in Europe, we have something like 15,000 skeletons now, varying in age from 10, 15,000 years ago up to present day. So we can see how the frequency of such a variant has changed over time. So I made a little movie here that starts 15,000 years ago, and carriers of this variant have black little dots, and non-carriers have gray dots, and red are just the Neanderthal and the Nisvan genomes. So if we now move forward in time here, you will, oh, that is a pity. Let me see. Come, come, come. Mm, let's see, let's try it again. We move forward in time, and you will see around 7,000 years ago, carriers of this become very much more frequent. This almost explodes in uh, frequency. And that seems to make no sense, right? Something that's bad and puts your baby at risk, why would it increase in frequency? So we could go back to the UK Biobank and ask, how carriers, and in this case, you actually ask the question the other way around. We ask the question, the modern non-Neanderthal variant of this receptor, what does it associate with in the UK population? And then we find that it's associated with an increased risk of bleeding early in pregnancy, with increased risk of miscarriages, and it's negatively associated with number of full siblings that you have, sisters and actually also brothers. So it seems that the modern variant is actually increased the risk of having miscarriages during pregnancy. So the story here seems to be that the Neanderthal variant is indeed associated with premature births, but it is also protective against miscarriages and results in more live births. So it's probably a trade-off where this Neanderthal version of the progesterone receptor saves pregnancies that would otherwise result in miscarriages. And the price you pay is that some of those babies are born early. And we begin to understand why that is too. Because if we look at 
how much of this receptor you express when you have the Neanderthal version, you express more of it. You have more of the receptor in the uterus, for example, sort of suggesting that you could have more of a progesterone effect. And over the past few years, it has indeed been four different studies now where one has given progesterone to women who have experienced multiple miscarriages before, and you can substantially increase the number of live births, compatible with this idea that more progesterone effect, either by having more of the hormone or more of the receptor, will result in more live births. And this is sort of a pattern. Many genetic variants of medical importance turns out to come from Neanderthals. Just as an example, there are two enzymes that are expressed in your liver and have to do with how you metabolize drugs. They come clearly from Neanderthals. They are very close to the Neanderthal genome. And for example, then, if you eat ibuprofen against pains, you have a much better effect if you have carry the Neanderthal version because the half-life in your blood of the ibuprofen is much longer. If you take warfarin to protect against blood clots, then if you have the Neanderthal version, you need to take a lower dose because you have, it's metabolized slower and it's a bigger risk for bleeding complications. Another example of this is uh, from the pandemic. Um, uh, or the, the corona pandemic, where, as you know, some people that get infected get very sick and even die. But most people who get infected have very few symptoms if, uh, or very mild symptoms. We know what the risk factor is to get some of the risk factors, old age, male sex, and so on. But all those risk factors are not enough to explain why one person gets very, very sick and another person have hardly any symptoms at all. So there was early on in the pandemic already an international consortium formed to look for genetic factors in the people who get infected, influencing how sick they get. And we were peripherally involved in that with some patients from Leipzig where we are situated. And when the first results came in then, we were very surprised to see that there was one big risk factor for this located on chromosome 3 there. And when we then looked at the DNA in that sequence, we were totally shocked to find that those risk variants there were closely related, particularly to one of our Neanderthal genomes. And the protective variants were modern, if you like. So this risk factor on chromosome 3 has come over from Neanderthals to modern humans and exists in some people today. And this, for being a genetic risk factor, this is a big one. If you were hospitalized early on in Europe in the pandemic with severe COVID you, and were not the carrier of this Neanderthal variant, you had a 7% risk of requiring artificial ventilation or even dying. And your risk, if you were a carrier and had this variant, was about twice that, 13 or 14 percent. So, of course, there is much interest in functionally what is in this region. Unfortunately, this region is very complex. There are several genes in it that are influenced in their expression by variants in here. So there are not yet possible to explain how this has these consequences. If we could do that, we could also hope to develop better treatments for severe COVID. But it's also very interesting to see the distribution across the world of this risk variant. As any Neanderthal variant is absent in Africa and present outside Africa, we can estimate how many extra deaths we had so far in the pandemic due to this Neanderthal contribution. And it's for sure one million, probably more than one and a half million extra deaths due to the Neanderthal contribution to the genomes of many of us. But you can also notice here strikingly that this variant is absent in East Asia. So it's absent in Japan, absent in China. 
but it's present at a substantial frequency, something like 50% of carriers in South Asia. So it's somehow very clear that this has been selected in the past. It has been bad in East Asia and it's been eliminated there. We don't know why. It's tempting to speculate it could be epidemics of coronaviruses, for example, in the past, in the history of humans in these regions. It has clearly had good effects to carry this in South Asia. Again, we don't know why, but it's clear that this region must have many functions, particularly in interactions with infectious diseases. And we're beginning to learn a bit about that. So Hugo then noticed that if you look in the vicinity on the chromosome here, one million base pairs down from this region, there is a famous gene there, CCR5. That is a co-receptor for the virus, uh, HIV virus, that gives you AIDS, to which the virus binds on the cell surface when it will penetrate the cell. And if we look at carriers of the Neanderthal risk variant for COVID, they actually express less of this, um, of, um, of this um, uh, CCR5 on their cell surfaces. So they have less of this receptor for HIV. And indeed, if we look at the risk of getting infected by HIV if you're exposed to it, that risk is reduced if you're a carrier of this Neanderthal version. So the story is that this Neanderthal variant on chromosome 3, it increases your risk for severe COVID, but it decreases, hmm, let me see, it decreases your risk of HIV infection. So it has Good effects if you're exposed to HIV, bad effects if you're exposed to COVID. So it's at least a double-edged sword, but we know that other factors have selected against it, for example, in East Asia, that couldn't have been HIV or uh, coronavirus, right? So it's at least a sort of a multi-edged sword. And that's a general message, I think, that genetic variants are almost never only good or only bad. It depends on the environment, and in this case, to which pathogens you're exposed. So just before leaving Neanderthals, I should say that they didn't only have a bad effect in the pandemic. Now when we have much bigger cohorts of patients, one begins to find other variants on other chromosomes that also inf influence how sick you get. On chromosome 12 there, there is a variant that comes from Neanderthals, and that is protective against severe COVID. In that case, we know the mechanism, there is a sort of genes there that induce a enzyme that degrades double-stranded RNA, the sort of form of genetic material in the coronavirus. And it's also protective against other coronaviruses, coronavirus one. But unfortunately, the effect is much smaller. So whereas the risk factor on chromosome three doubles or even triples your risk of becoming severely ill, this is just a 20% reduction of the risk. So we, before we end then, I want to just mention that what we are also particularly interested in now are these changes specific to modern humans that Karin mentioned in the beginning too. So these are then changes that happen on the human lineage and is present in everybody or almost everybody on the planet today. But they happen after we separated from Neanderthals. The Neanderthals look like the apes or other uh, mammals there. And why are we so interested in these changes? Well, we think that among them may hide some variants that are important for functioning as a modern human. And modern humans are very special compared to Neanderthals, Denisovans, all other forms of humans that have existed, I think. Because with modern humans, technology starts changing very rapidly. We notice that, for example, if you look at stone tools on Neanderthals, they look the same all over their distribution from Central Asia to Western Europe. When modern humans come, 
technology starts changing so rapidly, so it becomes easy to distinguish stone tools from Southern Europe or Western Europe or Asia, for example. What also comes with modern humans is figurative art, art that really depicts something that we immediately recognize as humans when we look at it. And as I already hinted, modern humans become much more numerous. They probably live in larger human groups. We can even see that genetically because they have more genetic variation in the groups. And they spread across the whole planet. They sail out on oceans where you don't see land on the other side. They come to places like Okinawa, where other forms of humans had never been. They come to the Americas, Australia, Madagascar, and so on. So a dream is that some of the sort of genetic scaffold or foundation you need to absorb modern human culture fully may be due to changes here that we could study. And those changes are not very many when we require that they should be present in everybody today and not in the Neanderthals. It's around 30,000 changes all over the genome and much fewer if we focus on things that we think have functions, so amino acid changes in certain proteins or changes that change how genes are regulated. And since we think that modern humans are special in terms of behavior, and cognition, maybe, we are particularly interested in things that influence the development of the brain or the function of the brain. And that is sort of things that we try to address at OIST at the moment in the little group I have there, and also in uh, Germany at the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig, where we also are. And with that, I then hope that I convinced you that it it's interesting to have the genomes of our closest evolutionary relatives because we can focus on these changes that make modern humans special. We can look at things that made Neanderthals special and look on their contribution to people today. What we also very much want to do is to study the Nisovan variants in the same way and their contribution in Asia, for example, in this country. And we then do that by using large data banks. We have genetic information and biological information from many people. But we also modify present -day cells from present-day people back to the ancestral state or even use animal models to address these things. And with that, I then thank you for your attention. Thank you. Wow, Professor, thank you. I have a feeling that you have inspired as many questions as you have answered. And now it's time for those questions. So please make your way to the standing microphones. We have one at the front, stage right, another one on the first platform right there, stage left, and one in the center at the top. You see folks waving there. Um, if you have a mobility challenge and would like to ask a question, just give me a wave and we'll, we'll get you a microphone. But first, a few house rules. If you're asking in Japanese, please take your receiver with you so that you can hear the answer. Please keep your question to just one so that as many people as possible have the opportunity. Please keep them on topic. So go ahead now. Please don't be shy. Um, while folks are moving around, uh, I'll go ahead uh, with my first question, Santa. Um, it's been a year since you got the call, what has the last year been like? Um, what have you learned? What has been unexpected? Hmm. Uh, no, no, I would say that, that what I have had to do is uh, adapt to saying no to very many invitations and suggestions. There was actually a joke in Stockholm when we got the prize a year mm -hmm. ago that they would give us something called a no bell. <laughs> a bell that says no in all languages if we pull it. So it's a no bell. <laughs> what, <That's, laughs> it makes us that much more grateful that you're, <laughs> that you're here today. Um, and then may I ask, what drew you to OIST and to o Okinawa other than the warm weather and the even warmer people? Mm -hmm. I was 
very privileged to be here, I think, six or seven years ago and get an honorary degree at OIST. And then I discovered what an amazing place it is to work. It's a very unique university, I think, that is composed of very many very good groups and it's a very flat structure where everybody has ability to, to interact with each other. And for us now, when we're interested in neurobiology, for example, I'm not a neurobiologist. It's an amazing place to be because it's very collegial and interactive and one can get lots of input. Wonderful. Thank you. OK, so let's, you and I put our earpieces on. We just press on. <laughs> Should be on the right channel already. OK, let's go to the audience. We'll, we'll start right here. Uh, what's your name and your question, please? My name is Michael Torelli. And I have a question about integrations, the bits of the Neanderthal genome in modern humans on X chromosomes versus autosomes. I think there's a very strong prediction that the X integrations will be much smaller, much lower frequency. Is that true? That's cool, because it is lower, yes. Um, so you make that prediction if you say that they were primarily male Neanderthals that contributed, because they will contribute an X chromosome only to their daughter and a Y chromosome to their son. So they would have less contribution on the X than females would. But more specifically, because of so-called dobzhansky muller incompatibilities. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Um, th th that said, though, I'm not ready to sort of. There are other reasons also why one has large segments of the genome lacking Neanderthal contribution. There's something called deserts of Neanderthal contribution. We find regions on the autosomes also where we statistically would expect. Neanderthal contribution, but we don't see it. So I want to leave it a little open to that might be more selection against Neanderthal versions on the X, particularly then because in males you have only one X chromosome, so things are exposed more to selection there. But yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, do we have someone down here? Yeah, go ahead. Good afternoon. I teach history at high school. I read a book by Brian Sykes, and uh, I'm interested in common ancestors. So what do you think about the future of this common ancestor research? Well, I would say uh, the book that you refer to by uh, the book that you refer to by Brian Sykes is about mitochondrial DNA, I think. And of course, as I indicated here, that is sort of a limited view of our inheritance. It's a female side, and it's just one instantiation, so to say. The bigger picture is in the nuclear genome, I think that that's where certainly the future lies in this research. And I think it's important to convey the idea that to the next generation that the variation around the planet is very, very, we are very mixed with each other. There were never sort of pure populations. One idea is there were pure populations and then we have mixed with each other. That is not true. There were variations from the beginning. And when we look in the human genome, for example, all over the genome, if we sort of say sub-Saharan Africans versus the rest of the world, so the biggest difference in frequency we have, there is it's still true that there's not a single thing that is an absolute difference in a sense. 100% have it here. 0% have it there. There are things that differ drastically in frequency, but these are frequency differences always. So these are the sort of things that I think is very important to convey as a teacher to the next generation, say. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, folks, please don't be shy. 
Okay, let's go up to the top. Do we have someone with that microphone? No? Okay, no problem. A few more questions. Yes, please. okay, I think we have someone here. <laughs> Oh, I get night force. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for your inspiring uh, research and uh, your presentation today, Professor Pabo. My name is Eka Maya. Uh, I'm studying marine molecular ecology uh, on the horseshoe scrap at University of Yukus. Uh, so I'm from Indonesia, actually. <laughs> so uh, we're a Chinese species of the Homonian uh, Homo florensis uh, that uh, still exists until nowadays. So that's uh, interesting also regarding your presentation. Uh, you mentioned the data on genetic characteristic uh, of Netherlands and the Denifonius. Uh, they spread from Africa throughout the Southeast Asia. Uh, the, so my question first is, uh, how do you see the study of if you compare uh, your study recently with the homonyms in Indonesia, that's uh, contributing, contributing to the uh, the broader narrative uh, for the narrative. I mean, for the human evolution, and then particularly in terms of migration uh, of pattern and the emergence of modern humans. Mm. So the question is how we would see Homo floresiensis mm. in sort of this. Oh, yes. yeah. That is a very interesting question. I think that's one of the most interesting. So Homo floresiensis is on the island of Flores. Mm. There is this short statured hominins one has found with very small brains that lived there quite recently. I think the last date is something like 30,000 years ago or so. So they disappeared sometime when modern, when Neanderthals and the Nisivans disappeared. Now they are very interesting, I think, because they have features that paleoanthropologists say suggest that they are an earlier divergence on the hominin lineage than Neanderthals and the Nisivans. Um, so we, are actually working together with people in Indonesia. Okay. Uh, we, now, unfortunately, there has not been excavations for three years because of COVID. <laughs> the next year, there will be excavations again on Flores. And we will then have one student there to take samples when the bones come out of the ground. So far, we have not been able to retrieve anything from the samples we have gotten from Homo floresiensis, mm -hmm. but from animals' bones in the same layer, stegodons actually. This is a little bit secret because it's not published yet, but from stegodons in the same layer, uh, we are actually able to get DNA. Now, that is easier because it's an animal mm -hmm. to distinguish contamination from real thing and so on. Uh, but I'm hopeful that that may happen in my lifetime, actually, that we will okay. get homo fluorescences. Okay. And then we might be able to date things on the hominin lineage sort of more accurately. I see. All right. So lastly, <laughs> my question, uh, I would appreciate any advice you can uh, like offer to young researchers like me now that how to maintain motivation to like our research version, actually. Oh, I often get that question and I don't really have any advice. <laughs> if I would say anything, I would say follow your interests, do what you really think is interesting and important. Mm -hmm. Because at least you have a good time while you're doing it then. <laughs> and then if you're lucky, it turns out to be something that results in something that others appreciate and is useful. Um, sometimes I even tell my students, you know, if you are mm -hmm. in science and have studied, you're smart enough to earn much more money if you go to banking <laughs> or business. Yeah. But so the only reason to really do it is that you enjoy it. All right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let's go to the front here. Go ahead.
息子が聞きたいなって言ってたのが、well, 息子5歳なんですけど、uh, he's five years old. And Dr. Pable, when you were five years old, I heard that you were interested in Egypt. Pable, 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 you were interested in Egypt.
you sort of you have this long term goal you often don't succeed in what reaching that directly but there are small progress sort of steps forward that you then continue to follow but Spenta, isn't it maybe part of it of how you see those challenges, you call them setbacks, that you see them as just that, a setback, so not necessarily a problem, but just how then you're going to get to the next road. Yeah, to the of next course road. the biggest challenge in science is probably to know when something you try to do is impossible, so you should abort it mm -hmm. and stop. That is sort of, yes. But yes, that's not an easy question to answer in some general sense. Right. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, down here. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is my question is when you lose, do you ever lose your focus on your research? When that happens, what do you do to bring back your focus? Those focus, particularly say when other things happen in your life that distract you, I think probably you should then take a break for a week or two and do something totally different and come back to it. Because if you really try and try and try, you probably just get stiff and don't make any progress. I would take a break, would be my only advice, I think. Thank you. Okay. Do we have some at the top? Please go ahead. Uh, my name is Sophia. The ancient people, like ourselves, the color of skin and the colors of the eye, were they different from what we have in modern human? So there's often a great interest yes, in skin color and eye color. Um, so the truth about much of genomics is that we are actually very bad to just look at the genome and infer how people looked or what they did. In many cases, we are very bad at it. Looking at the genome of a person today, I think we are just in the order of 70, 80 percent accurate in sort of predicting the skin color. If we then go to Neanderthals that were really a bit different, we're sort of even worse probably at that. So if we're interested in the skin color of Neanderthals, the truth is we don't know. We know variants that have come over from Neanderthals to us, that there are variants both associated with lighter skin and darker skin. So perhaps they varied in skin color just like, like we do. Um, it is interesting, one has a better accuracy in modern humans and these early hunter-gatherers, modern humans that came into Europe 30, 40,000 years ago and spread, they were actually with great sort of probability dark-skinned and had blue eyes. It's a sort of a strange combination that we don't see today. Oh, that is probably everything I know about that, yeah. Thank you. Okay, on my left, please go ahead. Hello, um, I'm Lea Picard. I'm a postdoc in Yamamoto Unit in Oist. Uh, so I have a bunch of questions. I will not ask all of them because a lot of people are interested Thank in you. asking them. Uh, I was wondering if there were admixtures between other like ancient human species like Denisovans and uh, Neanderthals. And the second part of that question would be also, what's the assimilation of Neanderthal within the uh, modern human species, like something that we observe in other species, uh, like with another closely related species with larger populations? Mm -hmm. So, so, yes, the more we study this, the more we see that they have all mixed with each other. In the Nisova cave, we have actually found one individual who is the first generation offspring of a Neanderthal mother and a Denisovan father. 
So that is sort of, we've been lucky to totally yeah, hit someone like that. Yes. Um, there is also, as I said, the evidence of gene flow in the other direction from modern humans into Neanderthals. We have much less evidence of that, but I think part of that is really ascertainment because we then need to find Neanderthals that are so late so their ancestors have seen modern humans. And that's, of course, very small percent of all the Neanderthal finds you find. Whereas the other way around, we can study anybody today and see the evidence of this, right? And the other question was if there's sort of assimilation. Yeah, of is that like a common aversionary? Yes. Uh, yes, I think, as I hinted, I think the more we now of Mm, I'm now a bit challenged. Eight or nine modern humans that are so old that they lived at the time when Neanderthals were around. Out of those, at least five of them have close Neanderthal relatives in their family tree. So I would sort of think that a big part of the story is a sort of assimilation where modern humans come or a bigger populations and sort of incorporate Neanderthals and the Nisimans. Does that exist in like other animal species, other mammals? Yes, I do okay. think that the more, even using the same methods that David Reich and others developed for the Neanderthal genome, people find more and more admixture between everything from butterflies to mammals to... Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, let's, down. let's go down here. Go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Sowa Azama. So, do Minatogawa ma'am have Neanderthal genes? Uh, we have not any DNA from Minatogawa man yet. But he for sure has it, because he's a modern human, and he will look pretty much like you and me in terms of one or two percent. We hope in the next year or so to be able to get some DNA from some old remains on Okinawa. Maybe not Minatogawa man, but maybe something else. Then I can answer the question better. Mm -hmm. So he'll have to come back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, do we have someone at the top? Thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. I'm a Ryukyu University student, and uh, my name is Genki Togawa. I'm also an internship student at OIST. First, I'd like to make sure that the African people from Africa spread all over the world, but those, the, the group, well, so after people spread all around the world, then the group from Africa followed. Is that correct? Sort of modern humans come out of Africa and eventually then, yes, differentiate a bit in different parts of the world and mix with these earlier groups. There has, of course, been later migrations both in and out of Africa, also back into Africa. We find a little bit of Neanderthal variants in Africa, but they always sit in sort of longer segments that come from Europe sort of due to back migration. But so there has been migrations also subsequently, of course. Go ahead. Does that, was that the right question and answer combo? I don't quite know <laughs> if I understood. <laughs> Just vaguely, yes, I understood. So, Denisovans are identified as a different, new type of human. 
And uh, I thought Denisovans could mix with Neanderthal. So when, how different are Denisovans? Like the, uh, when we estimate the time of divergence based on the differences in DNA sequences between the groups, they differed about 400,000 years ago from Neanderthals. Now that's really dependent on many things, such as what we think about mutation rates or so, but if we say that the divergence between modern humans and the ancestor of Neanderthalism is about 500,000 years, so this is sort of far back. So that means that they over a long time did not have that much gene flow between them. Even if it did occur, as I said, there in the Nisova cave, we do find evidence of it. We also find some evidence, actually, that the Nisovans are mixed with something else that's more deeply diverged, that Neanderthals did not mix with. There is a small contribution from something there. Who knows what it is? Homo erectus or something in Asia. Thank you. Okay, let's go down here. Hi there. My name is Ryo Uehara. My question is that when you received the Nobel Prize, how did you feel? Actually, I was totally surprised. And that's not just I say that because I thought I have gotten other very nice prizes, the Japan Prize, for example. But I thought that sort of what we do doesn't really fit into what they give Nobel mm -hmm. Prizes for. So I thought when they called me in the morning and said they want to give this to me, there was clearly someone from Sweden who called and spoke Swedish to me. <laughs> So I thought it was a joke. I thought it was some friend of mine who pretended to call from Stockholm and say this. So for like half a minute, I was saying, oh, yeah, yeah, tell me more, tell me more. <laughs> and then I realized that it was actually true. So I'm still very surprised, actually. <laughs> and Svante, can you tell us what happened? Um, I saw on Instagram there was a pool incident. Mm, yes, we have this tradition in our institute in Germany that when one finishes one's PhD, one gets thrown into the pond. So I guess my students <laughs> thought I had passed the exam now, so they threw me into the pond. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, back here. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Kobayashi, Dr. Pebo, thank you very much for your uh, interesting talk. My question is, as I uh, heard your uh, talk, the gene coming from uh, Neanderthal is sometimes susceptible for, uh, to pain, and there's a risk uh, to get infected uh, by a coronavirus and get severe. And there's also a risk of uh, early uh, birth of a baby, which is a sad image. Uh, I think that's a disadvantageous to survive. I wonder how come such genes, the negative, uh, which might work negatively, are survived today? And we all have this gene, and will it continue to be in us? to the, the futures, in future generations as well? I think that almost all variants are a bit like this corona risk variant, that they have both good and bad effects, and that may even change over time. You know, this variant that increased the risk of dying in the corona pandemic, where we almost, uh, in a sense, and see selection going on because you're twice as likely to die if you have it. We know that in South Asia it has reached 55% and it's 0% in East Asia. So it has clearly had some positive effects, probably due to other epidemics in the past. So I think for, mo and 
say, the, the progesterone receptor thing there, yes, it results in more premature births, but it also results in less miscarriages. So it is almost always the case that things have both bad and good effects, and that it may have been different in the past. If we go back a few thousand years, things that are today, we say, are negative, may be positive in the past, and may become positive again. So I think, with the exception of some, you know, variants that singly cause very bad diseases that kill you in a young age, that is clearly bad. But otherwise, I think this should really give us pause for thinking about, you know, thinking that we can tell what is good and bad in the genetics of people. Thank you. Hi, what's your name and what's your question? Hello. My name is Aina. What's your question, Aina? Did you forget question? <laughs> okay. Do you want to go ahead, Mom? Okasan, Kari Nido Deskak? Inside. Can you tell me what's inside our body? What, what are, <laughs> what's there in our body? Well, <laughs> to what we study is sort of this genetic material that came from mama and papa mm -hmm. in approximately equal amounts and made up you. And that then makes for making hearts and livers and uh, all the other things you have inside your body. Mm -hmm. Is that an answer? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Nina san. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, back here. On my left. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Dr. Pebo. My name is Sho Asato. I work for the Okinawa Prefectural Government. Thank you very much for a lecture with a nice Okinawan shirt. <laughs> my question is that there must be many different types of human, like including Denisovans, Neanderthal. How many different kinds were there? Um, so I don't think there is a room in the genetic variation of people today, for example in Asia, to have any big contribution from something else. But we know there were other forms around. As we discussed in, in Indonesia, there is this hobbit, the Homo floresiensis, that clearly was there recently and was quite different. Mm -hmm. But if they have contributed to present-day people, we don't know. We find this contribution from Denisovans all over Asia, and also in Native Americans that then come from Asia and so on. So I think if we're talking about what forms of humans were there when modern humans appeared, so sort of in the last 100,000 years, there are not that many forms, outside Africa at least. Mm -hmm. There are the hobbits, there is probably something else, could be something else, but not anything that contributed a large part of our variation today. In Africa, there are clearly other forms of humans around also. And it's a more complicated picture, probably. Okay. Thank you. OK, okay. stage right. Yes. Go ahead. Um, hello, my name is Amelia. And uh, my question is, you said that you were interested in this kind of uh, archaeology, paleontology, uh, since you were a young age. And I'm also very interested in the sciences. Um, but. Uh, whenever I try to learn about the more modern stuff that's been going on, the more technical and like uh, 
complicated stuff. Uh, I find that a lot of the science journals, they're full of this technical jargon and I get frustrated because I can't read the graphs and I can't read the sentences sometimes. So how would you recommend like aspiring scientists or even non-scientists, people who aren't up to date with that kind of jargon, how do you recommend that we keep abreast with the new innovations and the new publishings of these kind of modern sciences? Well, I, I would of course say that find good teachers and at the university you will learn to sort of, I hope you have universities here that allow you to combine very different things. I think I was very fortunate that I could study Egyptology and medicine and molecular biology. In many parts of the world now, it gets very focused. You say, you should become an engineer, and you should just study this and this subject. You become an archaeologist, and you study this and this. And it's often in the combination of things, as you say, that new things appear. Mm. It's even so that, you know, sometimes say, if you just say, I'm going to cure cancer, there are tens of thousands of very smart scientists that try to cure cancer out there. So it's very hard to sort of really make a contribution. If you combine something that hardly anyone combines, such as molecular biology and archaeology, you don't even have to be so smart to contribute <laughs> something because you have a unique combination. So the combining things can be a good thing. OK, thank you. Thank you. OK, let's go up at the top, please. My name is Nakajima. So part of DNA of us come from Neanderthal. But how about Neanderthals? Is there any uh, DNA in Neanderthal, Neanderthals that came from us, from the modern uh, uh, human? Really good question that has interested us a lot. So for a few years we were not able to find any evidence of DNA in Neanderthals from modern humans. But in the end we have now been able to find evidence that somewhere two, three hundred thousand years ago there were some gene flow out of Africa from ancestors to modern humans to Neanderthals. And we can detect that because that affected Neanderthals that lived, you know, outside Africa but close to Africa. Whereas we don't see that in the Denisovans, which are far away from Africa and were not affected by that. So we have this contribution in Neanderthals and not in Denisovans. And we've even found some specific genes that have come over there from ancestors to modern humans into Neanderthals, and then back to modern humans again, when they again mixed with Neanderthals, sort of back and forth. So indeed, just as you say, there is evidence for going in both ways. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Shimabukuro from Okinawa City. I have two questions. When you take sample of DNA, you are taking it from uh, bones, uh, like the pinky. Uh, any parts of, I, I'm wondering, the bones, that the DNA can be uh, extracted from any parts of the bones of the body? Are there p parts that you it is easier for you to take DNA from, like tooth, for example? In principle, you could take it from any part of the body. In practice, it turns out that some part of the skeleton preserve DNA better. The best one is actually the inner ear, something called the petrous bone, where, where the uh, there is sort of where you, the inner ear is located because it's a very compact bone. It doesn't have little channels through it where the water can percolate through and things like that. So ideally the inner ear, teeth are also often 
quite good, actually. The dentin in the teeth, not the enamel. And a good thing I could mention is that we also nowadays can take very small samples, four or five milligrams of material, so tiny, tiny amounts. Okay. Quick follow-up. Well, a kind of difficult question to ask. The, I'm wondering why Neanderthal are, are extinct. What do you think is the reason for the extinction? So why Neanderthals disappeared is in a way the million dollar question. Um, <laughs> I think that it has to do with modern humans and modern human behavior. Because not only Neanderthals disappear, you know, the Homo floresiensis in Indonesia, the Nisivans disappear, all other forms of humans also in Africa disappear. Now, it may not only be that modern humans were more aggressive and killed everybody, it could really be, there is some evidence, as I said, that the group size of modern humans were bigger than Neanderthals. It may simply be that one assimilated, they mixed in and were diluted. Very simple calculation, if your 2% of the DNA comes from Neanderthals, if there were 50 times more modern humans and Neanderthals, that would be 2%, right, of our genome. Now, I don't think it's that simple. It must have been more complex than that. But in principle, the sort of bigger group size. Then the next question is, of course, why do modern humans have a bigger group size that behave quite differently, also colonize across open waters and so on? It's something social and sociality, maybe. Sometimes I say it may not be that modern humans individually are uh, smarter than Neanderthals or something like that. But it may be something with sociality, that we are more into big group size politics, lying to each other, impressing each other, maybe things like that going on. Okay. The governor is not here, so we can say things <laughs> about politics. Or, yeah. okay. Thank you. Um, on that note, we do need to wrap up. For folks still standing, please make your Thank way you. back to your seats. Um, I do have a quick housekeeping or a couple of notes. Please be sure to return your responder. Please drop them off on your way out. Also, we have a survey through this QR code in the back of your program. Once you leave, when you get home, please be sure to fill that out for us. And uh, let me pose the last question. Um, so what are you most excited about for the future, either in your lab um, or in science generally? I would really say understanding some aspects of what sets modern humans apart. We will not understand that fully, but understanding some aspect of it, that would be a dream. Okay, so big possibilities. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Pavo, so much for choosing OIST in Okinawa to host your lab. We are so proud to call you one of our own. And thank you again to our co-sponsors, the Okinawa Prefectural Government and the Council for the Promotion of OIST. As well, thank you to our supporters, the Okinawa Prefectural Board of Education, Ona Village, and the Ona Board of Education. And to all of you, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you for being fans of Professor Pavo. <laughs>